All right, my good people. Recording. It's springtime. Planting out some uh, peach trees, actually, here. Okay, but let's get going with the meeting. So development team meeting, April, Tuesday, April 17, 2 p.m. I'm going to start with the cr critical path narrative and the recent trip to iMade 3D and a little bit of hubbub on GitHub. Uh, just some questions on that based on some of the comments before. Um, John is absent. He's working on a D3D for the PVC frame, Ohio. Ruslan, can you please type in what you, what you got for today uh, so we can keep this on schedule? And I'd like to do a five-minute wrap-up at the end to um, go forward. Um, let's see. Can somebody take notes as well? Um, Ruslan, if you wouldn't mind, uh, since you're the only one on right now, if you wouldn't mind taking notes, can you do that? Okay, okay. Okay. See if you can do that. Um, okay, so I'd like to start with uh, the recent adventures in the I Made 3D workshop. I participated. This was in in the Washington D.C. area. Uh, let's let me share my screen here for everybody, so you can see what I'm looking at. Okay. I made 3D workshops, so these guys are professionals. They've been around since about 2014, since they started. But what they're doing is immersion workshops for teachers, educators, teaching them how to build 3D printers. It's a good case of benchmarking for what we're trying to do. The OSE model is that we teach people to to produce and educate at the same time. So that's that's essentially how do we, you know, in a big picture, how do we uh, transition or make some positive change in society well getting more people to build stuff more productive people less bureaucracy that's the general theme the open source microfactory <clears throat> so education slash production is our way to do that because in the grand scheme of economics the experience economy is a big thing that comes up a lot of times as automation and and computer work fills people's lives people are still very hungry to do what's very meaningful and that's why OSC believes that a huge part of the future economy will be where more people get involved in production. It's it's a choice. I mean, we can still go centralized versus decentralized. Any is option, but it's any is an option, but it's up to us to to make that change. So we believe in making the change towards educating to people to be more productive, so there's less uh, <laughs> less uh, inefficiency or less bureaucracy in the world uh, as. We get more accountable for how things are produced because ultimately it's still about providing a modern standard of living based on natural resources. So with that said, here's a an immersion workshop that the guys from I Made 3D are running. I met Ladi. Ladi is the founder of that. I uh, met him at the Midwest Renewable, Midwest Renewable, the Midwest RepRap Festival uh, three weeks ago, and and I liked it. So uh, I liked what he was doing. So I decided to visit them, and I did. Uh, over two days. This was a two-day build. They've got a very nice print. I mean, it's really, really high quality. If you look at some of the links um, on these Facebook posts, you can see how fast it prints. It's really fast. It's it's quite good. Very nice design. Totally transparent in this transparent case. and But, but also very simple to build in the sense that they pre pretty much prepare most of the parts for you. So the the build is pretty trivial. It's it's an easy build that can be done in five hours by inexperienced people, in this case, teachers who have had no experience with 3D printing. Uh, now, for our workshops, our workshops are definitely much more complicated. We go much deeper into the build itself, like making our wiring, you know, drilling holes, and making parts that are not already built. So ours is harder, but still, we, can, we are... Uh, right now, we're at about eight hours for what our build takes. The Prusa i3 is apparently 16 hours if, if an expert person builds it, and 40 hours if a non-expert person builds it. For us, it's 8 hours in the workshop that we've, we've been doing. Uh, sometimes our workshops actually ran long, but, but it's doable in 8 hours. And we're trying to get it down to about 5 hours, so it's going to be a very robust model that you can do within a school day. Because think about like 9, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in a school day, that's, that would be another avenue where we can take our workshops too. So after seeing this, I'm observing that, wow, there is a huge market within libraries, schools, 
any education institution, any STEM or science, technology, engineering, math kind of program. The market is huge. I mean, everybody wants this. It spreads by word of mouth. And uh, Lottie is able to make a business model work very effectively. I mean, they are charging $1,995 for a two-day workshop, five hours each. Think about that. That's so they are providing a good program. In the second day, they, they do work on uh, explaining how to make 3D printable objects, how to slice them, how to run Cura, how to run a whole tool chain. So in the second day, people were actually designing a little thing. Uh, they were using Tinkercad, which is a proprietary uh, solution. For us, we can do... There's a, another one, another program called BlocksCAD that's actually open, fully open source that I think would lend itself well to a workshop like this. Or we can try to make it easy with, a, you know, for example, FreeCAD. We could program up a simpler interface for design that would reduce like the complexity of FreeCAD in, a, in like a say the simple FreeCAD workbench where you could make shapes very easily. I mean it's already doable but you have to know how to do it and definitely it wouldn't be a far cry to take FreeCAD to a very simple interface where you can you can create objects just like in Tinkercad Tinkercad T-I-N-K-E-R-C-A-D it's by Autodesk Autodesk bottom up um, but yeah but Anyway, a very nice experience in terms of seeing how a, a workshop that's well, very well established can look and definitely a lot of ideas for how we can do things and, and lots of good learnings. But the bottom line is getting the 3D printer, our 3D printer, just re making several refinements. Right now the main thing, and I'll go right to the, the development narrative. I'm going to click on to the, the source document for our critical path. But uh, from last year, we've been doing metal frames. We're d diversifying into plastic frames, PVC, for the reason that it would be very easy to do that on on a small, uh, well, no, on re in remote workshops where it's quite feasible to even pack up the materials and travel even by airplane because the PVC you can source locally very easily. So things like that. Uh, now, for Lottie's workshop with iMade 3D, their max audience is six six people, six builds, or possibly he said up to like ten, even up to ten or twelve if they have two instructors. For us, our max would be a hundred or one thousand or ten thousand. I mean, I actually envision the idea of uh, of a new sporting event, which is our extreme build, where you build in a big stadium, like giant stadium in in smelly New Jersey <laughs> where you build you have just these ext real extreme builds that we can we can do and I definitely see that as doable it's basically like a radical uh, big event which could we we could then apply to other things so you can do that with 3d printing but you can also do that to build an entire village with 10,000 people in one one weekend or stuff crazy stuff like that where we always push the limit of a swarm build <laughs> <laughs> questions, questions? Stop, now, isn't yeah. that just clear? <laughs> no, but go ahead. Go ahead. Millions. Millions, millions. I mean, where's the limit? Okay. No, did you have any um, questions outside of... Uh... I, have, I have a question. I just imagine uh, how this kind of uh, workshop will, will be organized. And I, think, uh, I, I thought about, uh, first of all, it's not only technical parts. Uh, also teaching, but not also teaching. There are some things we um, we need to think about. I suppose I'm not sure. Uh, 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 yeah, some thoughts. What can go wrong during the building? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean. You have a lot of not uh, not very experienced people uh, using uh, tools, probably the first time, and. Um, um, the more people you have, uh, the, uh, the, um, the greater is the chance of an accident or yes. something will be missing, uh, something was not working, and uh, how you will, uh, how it will work. For example, you, you, you s uh, say uh, to 10 people, please build uh, a frame in such a way, uh -huh. and then suddenly you have some guy, a woman, uh-huh where, where it doesn't work what would you do 
Yeah. Uh, what you're asking is a very pertinent question, and, and I'm not saying that this is easy. And in fact, um, when I ask this question to Lottie, like, why aren't more people doing this? And that is because it's, it's, it's very hard. It's not, not easy at all. Because the person who runs this workshop has both to be a technician and an educator. So, so definitely there's challenges pedagogically and practically. Now, as far as the, like, for example, to address this, this there are two main things. First, you have to be very well prepared. Everything has to be well proven. And the documentation has to be very explicit, very, very high quality. And Lottie also shared the idea that uh, people just, after about three hours, people just stop reading any instructions. They get, their minds are filled. So, so that's where he said, oh, the only way people can do that is language agnostic instructions where you don't even have to read. But the point being that the quality of the instructional material written and guided, like the guide in, during the workshop, has to be, be very well, well developed. And how do you, how do you address one of, the, one of the main issues is when there's a diverse skill set range in the, in the group itself where one person is, you know, twice or even three times as fast as another, you know? Um, yeah, and that you can address. Uh, I, I've thought a lot about that, and, and, we've, and we've done this. What we do is we simply, for some parts, we, we do completely together. We work those parts as a team, so there's a workflow within a team so that if one person is stuck, others can help them. But the general idea is for the, the, the way I think it could work best, and that's what we try to do, is we go step by step and we do not allow people to go ahead or be left behind. In other words, if there's a person that's left behind, the idea is the first person that's finished goes out to finish, goes out to help the person that's, that's lagging behind. And obviously that takes some good organization to, to make sure that we know who is, who is going forward, who is going behind, but make it clear up front during the event that the rules are as such. You do not get to, to move forward. You're like the bunch of crabs in a bucket where if any crab tries to jump out of the bucket, the remaining crabs actually yank it down. And that's actually true. This is true. It's, uh, I've heard that story being told as like Mexican crabs or crabs in a bucket, but, but that's true. We actually have to hold the person who's trying to go forward, hold them back. And this is fine because the idea is that we are trying to finish as a team. We're not trying to say, oh, one person's going to finish and feel proud. No, they, we have to have everybody finish. So that's one, one technique that we have seen work, and it, it works pretty well. We basically have, as soon as somebody's done, we have them, okay, go, go help the person that's, that's not done and make it work like that. So, so that's the challenge, but I think it's definitely addressable because the good people can help the slower people. Does that, does that make sense? Or? It makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, I didn't uh, thought about it uh, in such a way because uh, I have more experience in uh, more um, university type of education where uh, look how fast people do exercises and they are usually not allowed to help uh, to do exercises uh, when the students if they get some exercises if they must uh, walk uh, alone or a little group and here we have a different situation I just didn't thought about it right exactly and that's the rules here are simply different and we found that this actually works really well so so we're that's why i'm saying we can do these very large endeavors because of our initial experience with this method and as time goes on we refine it so things like you know every person has access to language agnostic instructionals little videos a model that's right there on the desk so for example in this build if anyone was stuck, they could look at the actual finished machine to see if there, if there was any question of how something fits together. And then the guide, the person who's the leader of the workshop, they're a very important role because they're the ones that observe who's, who's first, who's last, what are the issues, does everyone have what, what they need. And actually, one other big point of that is, which Lottie emphasized quite a bit, <clears throat> and this is how, <clears throat> how they do it in Five Sigma, like the... the the quality control methods, the tool layout is very important. So on each table we had a, first we started by laying out all the tools very carefully. All the tools were already available and accessible. 
and the materials were organized well. Every single table had the exact arrangement of parts on each table, so you knew where everything is, and it ends up working pretty well. So, so yeah, I was glad to actually see this because, because you know, I've had notions about how this could work and how what the limits are, and here certainly this was a very clear case that in five hours, actually in this time, uh, this this turned around turned out that people didn't finish until about 4:45. Uh, the first day, in other words, like six hours, 45 minutes, which he said that this was like the longest it ever took them to build the 3D printer. But typically they're about 50% of the time they finish in five hours and mostly they and their other 50% they, they typically take to like another hour. But how we did it in 645 was actually a little longer. And then of course you can simplify the the build to be as easy as possible so the main difference like if you compare this to how how we do it for us we optimize the maximum redundancy of parts by using the universal axis it's the same axis that you build on both x y and z so that makes it go much faster now here in this printer it's very complex and unique and each 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 axis is very different it's it's everything is very custom so this is not a Kind of a redundant simple design kind of a machine it's it's a pretty complex one there's a lot of lot of information content within the design itself itself but they spend a lot of time preparing all those parts whereas for us we're saying you pretty much source off the shelf parts and then you build it build it all and for us it's very important because for example if i talk to you about a thousand person build right that's crazy amount of preparation time if the amount of time to prepare the parts is large like 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 for example I made 3D they they do a lot of work in preparation and of course you got to do a lot of work but we try to minimize the amount of work that you need the minimum amount of uh, pre-processing that you have to do in order to make it feasible like for example their frame their frame is laser cut it actually has labels and notes on the frame which actually serve as instructionals they tell you like where the wires go they have like a profile for where the circuit goes and where other parts go, etc. Uh, for us, we don't do as much of that, but that's why we can just take, like if we do the PVC version, we can take the eight corners from Amazon and take, say, the three-quarter inch PVC and cut it right there. Even with, uh, there's, a, there's a hand cutter you could do for that. So, so we can do that, would probably take some, a few hours of CNC time, we can do probably in in 20 minutes using hand tools if we use the PVC frame. So so we our philosophy on that is to make it really really uh, optimized for the local sourceability of parts. And just to give you one one example, I got into a long discussion with Lottie about this. Um, he said he told me I asked him, okay, so can you print? Because he uses a lot of uh, zip ties, and I asked him, well, do you want to end up? Oh, zip ties. Um, look at my screen. Yes, I These are the zip ties. You know those? Oh, okay. Yeah. So he, his like main main build technique is zip ties. I mean, it still works very well. But I asked him, okay, so do you want to be three D printing them? They're made of nylon. And he said, he says, no, that's ridiculous because uh, they're two cents each. And that's where I differ. I say, no, 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 I mean, it's still very much valuable because then if you can use the 3D printer to print your own zip ties, um, that's actually a huge pedagogical value as well as the value, like, what if you can't get zip ties in your, in your country or something like that? Or what if you're on an island or on a cruise ship and your zip ties fell overboard, you know? Um, so, so for us, it's about easy... Like, uh, just a normal situation, you are in an island yeah 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 just a, just an average normal situation yeah um, but that's but for us we really really emphasize the idea that the parts are simple and a lot of them you can print like some advantage for example for the pvc pipes it doesn't um, 
they are pretty standard everywhere. Right. And we, we they, uh, and the, I suppose they are producing the good quality from multiple companies. Right. And for us, it's easier to buy some and we see by them and we are pretty sure that, uh, that they are good. Yeah. And the same for this uh, cheap tires. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. I mean, you can, there's different ways to do it. For me, I just think it's very valuable if once we really perfect, say, the PVC frame version as, as one of our options, we can print the corners. And in fact, we can print the PVC option. pipes themselves. Option. Like an option. Okay, we can see it this way. Yeah, it's, a, it's an option where in some cases you will need it. It's just, I mean, the whole point that we try to emphasize is the resilience. The resilience is that you have more than one option. You have multiple options, and that's always good in life. It's, it's a good philosophy and a fundamental core philosophy of OSC that, that redundancy or multiplicity of options, diversity of options, that's all good because it means that you can stay out of trouble. If you get in trouble, you just go to plan B and you're still perfectly fine. And that, that is very important because, you know, ultimately speaking, philosophically, if, uh, the limit of that is war. Like, if you have no options, you end up going to war and like in the political limit of what we're saying here. It's like, okay, you, you don't have resources, you're, for, you're forced to steal them from somebody else. Well, we don't want to do that by design. Okay, um, so let's, let's continue. So, so that was a great experience and definitely good learnings. And, and I think the, the major encouragement for, on our part is to understand that, wow, the markets are huge. Like, for example, when I came back, I said, okay, Maysville High School is about two, uh, two miles away from me, the small town here but they're gonna have our printer pretty soon so and and we can go there and probably if we uh, do a workshop there then we can do something like okay mr librarian why don't you invite um you know 10 more librarians from the surrounding cities and they can you know help us market that they can help us actually get the crowd of people that well first they'll have to see it themselves that it, that it works and and by the time we do a few of these by word of mouth we're going to probably have more more interest than we can handle and that's why that kind of brings up um, the the pathway here like while you see that our we're very good very consistent on, on the reduction in our <laughs> number of total development hours we're gonna get that back up as we um, go to peop, go to the training program and have have a number of a good number of people doing the workshops as we start to grow so basically start having people get paid for the work that they do as a means to bootstrapping further development because there's many many developments to be made uh, according to the development map so so on the development map let, let me just get into there but I mean I'm kind of stripping this this thing down to okay the main core is the OSC immersion program we focus on a OSC microfactory level one 3d printer CNC circuit mill laser cutter and filament maker and hopefully well-developed processes for photogrammetry and if you want to see the the development narrative for that click on a link in a in a google doc uh, i actually spent a little bit of time to to define where is that no that's that's just going if you go to the page called critical path uh, i made it a point to emphasize the development narrative here in point number three like, why are we going about it this way? Well, in brief, and actually I, I want to go, go over this because it's pretty important. Like, people are asking, okay, what are we doing this year? Um, it's the level one microfactory. 3D printer, CNC circuit mill, laser cutter, 3D scanner, filament maker. 3D scanning means photogrammetry. Excuse me, I'm still looking for, for the link for uh, critical pass. Okay. Well, um... Okay, there's a link in a, in a chat box if you if you still need it. But what is the... Uh, so we start with this entry-level microfactory on a path to the larger work that we're known for, like the tractors and houses and so forth. But the relevance of starting with the very small set is quadruple. So there's four major reasons why we do that. So first of all, it's the substance of a one-month immersion program in September where we teach OSE fellows to run workshops. Now, number two, this also allows us for rapid prototyping and extreme design jams. 
So rapid prototyping with all those machines, including the, the filament maker that you can actually take scrap and recycle, you've got a basic, basic infrastructure for prototyping. Um, that means OSE machines, uh, scale models, actual real 3D printed products like, like uh, cordless drills, etc. And Extreme Design Jam. So what I'm thinking is now if everyone has access to this micro factory, then the design jams could happen, which means that we do an extreme build and then follow it with some de development work using the machines. Like one thing that I think I mentioned that, for example, even developing new 3D printer filaments like ones that are filled with metal or whatever. Okay, so but number three, uh, the relevance of the micro factory. Consumer products of the open source everything store. So click on that, but the idea is we can then build a whole wide range of open source products that are made of plastic, off the shelf parts, circuits, little cuts from laser cutter, small laser cutter. There's a whole range of products there. Cell phones, aerial drones, microscopes, uh, rob small robotic arms, cameras, I mean, name it. There's so many consumer goods that are just plastic elect plus electronics, essentially. We can do all of that, and we can focus on design competitions where, say, we, we have a number of OSC fellows active, then we can do design competitions in different areas around the world or around the United States first. Okay, so that's big. Okay, point number four we can actually start on the part of producing materials by recycling waste plastic with a filament maker. So part of the GVCS is that we use natural, uh, local or recycled materials. So this micro factory at level one allows us to start get, getting into that. Imagine we collaborate with schools and we set up recycling pro programs at every school we go to because we teach them how to recycle their cafeteria plastic and actually make 3D printing filament that then they use in their science class to build little prototypes. So that's very powerful. That's the market for that is huge. Okay, and, and then further, the level one micro factory fits on one's desktop and it can produce, um, or, or it can be networked to the internet where then you can start talking about uh, on, c machines that you can control online. That means you can st start up on-demand 3D printing services or then CNC circuit milling capacity or, or other different functions as we go forward so that would like for example with the CNC circuit mill that would be a great enterprise there's you know you typically get those done by by big companies that do your chemical etching or whatever photolithography but I'm not sure anyone does it with an actual circuit mill that and that could be a small viable business now, pedagogically, the value li lies in a product design, the, all the curriculum that you can make around this, product design, rapid prototyping, reverse engineering, community-based digital manufacturing, which can be inserted into STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, math, STEAM, which adds arts, STREAM, which adds, um, they add the R, which is read and write, that means documenting. And we actually, uh, if you, click on stream I actually did uh, we go to X stream and let's see is that there yeah Google put it's on the wiki look at my log for X stream um, but production wise open source the open source everything store has the potential to become a powerful force op of open source distributed product development and manufacturing and then OSC product development wise the extreme design jams can combine extreme manufacturing workshops with prototyping and design using the micro factory tools we can start up incentive prizes and co-opetition so I like the word co-opetition and competitive cooperative uh, a cooperative competition so we can create purpose-based contests for producing real products like even with school kids that could transform competitions such as FIRST or VEX Robotics into direct economic relevance by practical product development of presumer goods. And then operations-wise, OSC fellows aim to address the need for regular workshops that OSC runs, and then they could run the Extreme Design Jams for community building in real life, plus further uh, which is in addition to the virtual development, because right now we do the OSE dev team, which is virtual. 
but if we do the extreme design jams on a regular basis then we can start inviting people from the public and, and start meeting us and keep the whole ball going so that's that's kind of the development narrative for which which is summarized in this critical path for 2018 and as you see on October November there's a slew of workshops coming up after September so that's if we succeed at running those workshops that would be great so I have both workshops and design jams happening right after September so that's that's awesome and then on the CDK home front here uh, there is we do do still plan on the major seed eco home workshop so that would be a one week of immersive training followed by a one week of build of an of a small micro house that we're trying to make as a as a production model for for the open building institute um, one more note here is that on uh, the precious uh, so the filament maker so now you see the the new new and improved pre I call it precious Lyman filament maker so a mixture between precious plastic and Lyman filament extruder and after looking at that carefully uh, I've observed that the precious plastic extruder is much more robust it can work with any plastic and it can work with scrap whereas the Lyman filament extruder typically works from pellets which are bought you can't make them yourself easily so the precious plastic a grinder extruder is larger so we can do that and then we can take the winder part which is the winding of the filament onto a spool uh, from the the Lyman filament maker because the Lyman version has that well worked out whereas the precious plastic doesn't have the filament production aspect worked out so we can combine those together but that's that's definitely a development point um, so that leads us to the OSE immersion. Um, whatever time I get, I, I'm working on a curriculum for that and working on a book, the book publishing, since that's going to be a critical thing to align everybody on the same culture, uh, to get everybody on the same page of what's going on here. So any, any comments at this point? Okay. Okay, so let's, let's continue going here. Um, so it looks like um, uh, the critical developments are definitely the different versions of the 3D printers um, and let's see so let's look at the latest CAD and let's download it and there's a couple of comments to be made on that um, regarding the the plastic versus metal versions I'm thinking that um, definitely the plastic version is good for lightweight remote workshops easy to source parts and in practice, we'll get to see, okay, which, which one is better and which, which one we're gravitating to. Right now, I cannot see um, whether we'll be going more to the plastic versus the metal, which are, I think, both good options. Um, definitely, the plastic is not as strong and would have to be reinforced if we do things like milling. So that may not be the right thing there. And maybe we end up with the metal, but it's just speculation. We're doing this for now and seeing, seeing where we end up. But the good thing is that all the parts are modular. Uh, if you have the, the frame, that's just one of the many modules. And the extruder too, uh, we have flexibility in the extruder, like John is doing the, the Prusa i3 MK2, that brand of the extruder. And I'm actually right now prototyping a version of the plastic frame with the Aero uh, Titan Aero by E3D, which is a a much higher performance extruder that's designed both for pla for the the regular plastics as well as the flexible filaments so the relevance of the Titan Aero extruder are that it's a much higher performance version but it's also with that performance comes the price too the Titan Aero extruder is if you buy it from E3D it costs $120 just for the extruder, um, which is not not cheap. And the like the Prusa i3 MK2, we can probably build that for more like $20 in parts, um, if you don't count the motors. So so the, about a hundred dollars difference in the price of the extruder for the higher performance that we would need, and but as you see here we can fit either either or okay and now actually looking at this more carefully I'm looking at I'm seeing that there's an issue here 
uh, to uncover. But basically the idea is, and this is actually not shown here, but you see the motor. Our standard way of attachment was that we actually stuck the motor back into our extruder holder and that's how we can attach the motor to our carriage. Now here we have the plastic to plastic meeting up. So John, if you review this, um, the preferred route would be to have this motor sit in the standard holder. So if we go to the D3D part library, uh, just to show what that, that is, the, the standard way we were doing this was using this holder right here. Uh, this holder where the back of the motor just sits in it and this, this hangs on the, on the carriage. So I would actually suggest that we do that. Otherwise, we need a... Uh, if we go with this route here, that means we are somehow attaching uh, the this extruder to the carriage, which is not exactly that easy because... Uh, somehow we have to do it. I th how is that done here? Uh, I'm not sure how it's done here, uh, but I'm, I, I think I'm seeing these screws here, if I'm correct. Uh, possibly these screws holding holding on the extruder. But um, it's probably I would say my my comment would be that it's probably easier to just use our standard holder because then that standard holder could be made to work directly with either this extruder or the Titan Aero extruder. So we do know that this extruder works well. It's the Prusa I I3 MK2. It's a very well proven design. Um, it's not as good on the flexible filaments. It's not designed for flexible. So that's the disadvantage of it. Um, the, the Titan Aero is specifically designed for the flexibles it doesn't have this long pathway here where the filaments can actually bend and and the, the difficulty is pushing flexible filament because it's flexible it will end up bending on you so this long length here is eliminated in a Titan arrow by design the, the the cooling part is actually above like right on this upper part here but anyway it's technical details um, but we can use both and and uh, here we have our eight millimeter, eight millimeter probe, so that's good. Uh, but yeah, I think John, I'd like to ask you, yeah, what are your thoughts on just using this, um, just attaching the motor to our standard holder that we already have without having to modify the, the way we're attaching this, so you can literally interchange them uh, just by by loosening one or two screws but other than that that's pretty good uh, let's see anything else on John's part here short idlers have been added so that's good calculation page filled out so Rod length is kept at 500 millimeter. Let's see. Uh, extruder calculations. In other words, the geometrical design here. So that looks like it goes right to the edge of the bed. Yep, that's looks pretty good to me. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, he's got it pretty much right on. Uh, PVC frame. So we have 493.5 millimeter lengths. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it looks pretty good. The only question I have is, once again, the, the, the way we mount the extruder. And from prior work, let's see, I know Roberto, uh, I think, 
modified the extruder and let's see how he had it mounted not sure when we discuss so maybe yeah John if you can email me about your thoughts on that I'd like to hear your thoughts whether you think this is good to go or whether you'd wanna if this is simple enough to mount because I'm not sure about the mounting detail uh, and I guess the way it looks here this plate I see uses these long screws so if these long screws are easy to source they are an extra part so that does add uh, another part little bit of part count I think we discussed that actually before but yeah I, I guess the novelty here is that after thinking about it um, I would ask is it possible to just put this back on the uh, standard extruder holder and therefore we can remove this part here unless unless this is actually easier but I haven't looked into this in detail enough to tell so yeah John please get back to me on that okay good stuff um, next let's go to Abe so I'm not sure if Abe has Abe got anything new since last week updating BOMs to the power cube okay not sure how much new we've got there okay and then I guess last part would be so Ruslan if you have any any comments to make today Yes. If you think about stuff like sustainability, I don't know the proper pronunciation. Sustainability. Yes, this property. Yeah. And we also want to create tools. And then I think. Are you talking about uh, software tools or physical tools?
Uh, can you bring down your discussion to the practical consequences here for what we're doing? Are you talking about within the workshop scenario? Uh, also workshop, but also for ourselves. Um, maybe not focus uh, on hardware, but also uh, time optimization or social optimization to use things with, uh, to share things with the community. I look at this. Uh, Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, can we bring this down to, for example, okay, say we, say we design a cordless drill that we can now maintain for a lifetime as opposed to throw out after one year. Like, how would it apply to that? Yeah. And most of the time they will uh, uh, lay around without being used. This is a waste of resources. Yeah. Because we don't think about it. And instead, probably as a part of our uh, philosophy, not only to produce tools, but also some kind of sharing. Of course, the community uh, should be uh, a good community. Uh, there are some people, for example, I will never give my tools to them because they don't share, uh, they will not treat them well. Uh -huh. Nevertheless, uh, just mentioned, this cordless drill will most of the time not use. And uh, if we, if you were talking about the village, yeah. Scarce. Yeah. And um, we need probably to think about if we really need uh, a cordless drill for everyone, or maybe it's something which is not used that frequently. Right. Yeah, well, I mean. It's a good point to say that we de develop social infrastructures as well as hardware infrastructures. I think, for example, with the 3D printer, we have that in some way already in a sense that we're developing the print cluster because then people who are not in our house can actually rent our printer. So that's an example, right? Of exactly what you're saying? This is a good example. Yeah. But what other ways could we do? I mean, definitely in a plan we have or at least thought about, so tool lending libraries. I mean, say we have our facility that's more built up, part of its operations could be a tool lending library. Uh, that definitely could happen. So things, things like that. Uh, tool rentals. I mean, just, just like, I mean, there's many businesses that already rent tools. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely we want to design things to optimize the, the usage. Like, for example, if we, you know, like, if I think about the, I, I mean, can you make any specific comments on that for the, like, say, the, the fellows, the OSC fellows after they get training? So they have a basic set of tools, and they're used, like, for example, the 3D printers, the idea is to build a couple, a couple or even more 3D printers, because if you're going to run a workshop, like, say you do a couple of workshops every 
every month, you're going to need to build parts for at least, say, 24 printers. So that's where you'd need... Um, your printers will be running a lot of the time and you can be making kits for others and you can do on-demand printing so we can definitely for example use that 3d printer full-time and the filament maker and if we have the online circuit making I mean the circuit all those tools could be running a uh, hundred percent of the time once we develop the high quality products and services around them so one side is developing the tools but also the services the usage of it, the education around it. So I think, I mean, it seems like we're well covered for uh, good tool utilization. Uh, these, are, uh, these are good points. Uh, uh, my, um, the idea which I thought about change was uh, because of uh, Godless Trio. Yeah. I, I read about it and I thought, oh, I, I can build for myself. And then I realized I have a Godless Trio. Most of the time, I don't use it. Yeah. Right. Well, then the other part is, uh, what if that cordless drill has is like the Swiss Army knife of cordless drills that you can interchange the head so you can have multiple functions? So that's also another way to extend its usability. Or design the cordless drill such that it's actually the device that powers your filament maker. You know, so you can think a lot about product ecologies, how the things fit together and still are practical. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, an average person, like, unless you're getting involved with the cordless drill quite a bit, I mean, you don't really care so much about a cordless drill. But if you're a builder, if you're running workshops constantly, then, yeah, you need a lot of cordless drills like we do. We need a lot of cordless drills. Like if we build a house, I mean, people break them and uh, it's just everyone, everyone literally, or at least half the people have a, have to have a cordless drill because you're doing screwing or drilling and stuff like that. And the, wh what property should this uh, tool have? The biggest one is lifetime design. The flexibility that if you break it, you can fix it or you can extend its its function to a different function. So, So lifetime design and modularity. Because that, I mean, look, why did I say the cordless drill? Why don't I just buy them? Well, the reality is our drills here last probably like six months. People break them. Uh, they drop them or whatever, you know. So, and then just like one little part goes, goes out. It could be as simple as the on-off switch breaks and you can't really replace it because it's not designed to be replaced and you just have to throw the thing out. It's just ridiculous waste of waste of resources, and that's that's the reason that's the thing we want to address. Just like precious plastic talks a lot about that too, uh, he says let's recycle stuff so that it doesn't end up in the landfill. Reuse, recycle as the first options, um, because which is okay if we talk about it philosophically more. Um, do you know Kardashev scale? Yeah, I'm going to paste the link, and I think it's a, it's actually a very important concept uh, now that I found out about it, uh, I, I see how relevant it is, but Kardashev scale refers to the amount of energy that civilization, civilization uses. Well, right now, we have a throwaway society because we have so much excess energy. We are not in a shortage of energy. Like, okay, the, the fossil, I'm, and I'm not talking about fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are scarce. What's absolutely abundant is solar energy. Because 10,000 times more power comes from the sun than we currently use. So the, the Kardashev scale means that we are at Kardashev scale 0 0.001. We're using like one ten thousandth of the energy that's available today. And the ramifications I are, huh? Probably I remember this is some kind of science fiction. Yeah. This, yeah, around, uh, stuff, yeah. Like right. But the the interesting point there is that 
we still have so much more energy and so much growth that can happen on the planet. Um, so we don't care about wasting energy. But we should because wasting energy is, you know, it's, it takes resources. So we should care about it. I definitely care about the, the design for, for reuse or lifetime design. And just on environmental grounds that you're not generating junk for the landfill and all the issues around pollution or or resource extraction which are definitely not solved as we talk about humanity we haven't solved those things we still have to go to war over oil that's not good um, but the Kardashev scale concept allows you to kind of frame that because because the point is we have to become responsible because we can't just be thrown away energy and um, I think having a handle on that concept allows us to think more about our human responsibility because if we don't care we can be very wasteful and we ha that means we have to think about what the limits are that we would like to impose upon ourselves. Do we actually want to have like 10,000 times more people on the earth than we have today? Well clearly that, that would pose some issues. So we have to start asking well what's the what's the good population level or resource use level on this planet should we settle at like 10 billion like we're at 7 billion right now is 10 billion enough do we want to go to a hundred billion because we certainly could and there's plenty of land like if you don't live in a city you understand that there's like i i don't live in a city and i and i see just how much land there is out there uh, that's just unused and there's plenty of deserts that can be reforested and so forth so we have to actually ask that question in a serious way, and I think uh, resource reuse gets us at least thinking about that a little bit. I, I think uh, there is, um, we should ask uh, professionals about the land usage. I talk with, with, some, uh, with a woman who knows more about uh, farming and soil than I and she that uh, a lot of uh, land is destroyed and uh, uh, how can I describe it? But, uh, no, I'm well familiar with that. The stuff uh, washed away? You know? Yes, absolutely. The, there's four tons of topsoil on average are eroded every year per acre in the United States. Just think about that four tons per acre this is no joke this is what that means is that about a hundred or two hundred years ago my land here would have about six feet of topsoil on it right now it has between like one and four inches of topsoil and we took those measurements Right, right. We have to be careful. The idea is that we want to leave it in a better state, not in a worse state. That's the idea of regenerative development. Uh, right now, that hasn't. People don't really talk about regenerative development. They they're just saying, you know, make more shit, <laughs> buy more stuff. You know, they, the we do not have a regenerative culture at present. So, I think it's part of the transition that we have to learn. But anyway, that's. That's uh, philosophical issues that are very important to what we do at Open Source Ecology. It's We try to raise those issues to the front that, no, I mean, the destruction that we have right now, it's it's pretty bad. Like, if you think about it, like the topsoil loss, I mean, uh, pretty much like all the agricultural land is just a desert. The only way they keep it alive is by feeding it with a lot of chemicals. That's the only way they keep it alive and producing because it, it got stripped of most, most farmland got stripped of its all its biological activity yeah um, but anyway anyway um, let's see so what are your next steps for um, are you still working on the um, piping work because I'd like to request I don't know if you can um, you know if you have time to work um, According to the critical path, the, the big thing on it is still the D3D workbench. If you could put some time into that after you're done with the piping, 
because uh, that would be really good to have people design their own versions. Yeah. Uh huh. They're they're interested in helping out on that. They are interested in that, or. Very good. So on a, that, and that could be added to the D3D workbench because that could be one of the frame choices. Yeah, yeah. So as far as the piping workbench, what are your last steps that you have to finish? Yeah, no, that's great. That's good. That's a definite uh, worthwhile addition to our set of tools. Uh, what kind of timeline are you looking at for wrapping up with the piping workbench? Uh, I cannot say now because I, uh, I last time I do a lot for university and uh, mm -hmm. uh, research stuff. It's also um, cost some time. Um, I, I, I cannot say. Yeah. Um, how many hours do you think are left? Do you have an, an idea? I suppose uh, 30. Okay. Maybe 20, 60. Okay. All right. Right. That's just yeah, just for piping. That's that's correct. That was asking. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So uh, let's wrap up here. And the summary is yeah, we've got our development narrative. Uh, if anyone wants to comment on that, please do so. Click the uh, go to the critical path page on the wiki and comment on this. So so the piping the D three D workbench is right this item right here. Um, a lot of the effort is going to the immersion program and with that hopefully we get uh, we reverse our consistency downward consistency here to an upward consistency and in two weeks is when I aim to do the first uh, about yeah two it's less than two weeks about 10 days I'm gonna do the first announcement I was aiming for May 1st as the announcement uh, the initial announcement for the the OSE immersion program, a five-week five week immersion on site where we teach you everything we know about 3D printing and how to build the 3D printers. Not only that, but how to design them. So that's where the design workbench would help us a lot. Now we can definitely teach people how to do that by simply importing the modules, but it would help us a lot if we have the the workbench which makes it easier and more parametric so that's that's the relevance other than that thank you very much we'll continue next week then so see you then bye bye, -bye.